yes, it's time, it's time, it's time. I know I've heard the complaints, too many abstract labs, XRD, DSC, uh, and now we're finally gonna get to what everyone wants, which is breaking things. Uh, and the heart of material science, and there's one thing I want you to take away from this class, it's to be able to kind of identify and uh, know the properties on a stress strain curve. So, we are gonna be using an Instron 3369 uh, uniaxial tension testing machine apparatus. Uh, again, as I mentioned in our kind of introduction video, you can do more things. There's lots of other um, kind of uh, clamps and configurations, but today we're gonna to be doing simple loading uniaxial tension, te tension testing. So you can see we have these kind of claws that have are built for these uh, kind of rectangular samples, these dog bone samples that we're gonna be doing today. This is aluminum 6061 our first victim. <laughs> so uh, these claws, these grips, are made for um, uh, basically uh, samples that are uh, rectangular in nature. We have other grips, where I'm trying to find right now, sorry for the, but you can kind of see the hole here. Those are for cylindrical samples. Let me see if I can find you a cylindrical sample. A cylindrical sample that's rusted like this. So. We are going to be working with dog bone, uh, kind of the traditional samples for aluminum 6061. We are going to also look at copper. We're going to also look at uh, our high density polyethylene and polystyrene. So, this is our apparatus. One of the key things here is safety. So, 50 kilonewton load cell. So, it's, that's a lot of stress that's being, or a lot of forces being generated. You can see these stoppers here. So, these stoppers, and actually, I'm going to have to adjust this guy. You don't ever adjust this without my uh, say so. So, you can kind of see these stoppers. Once this hits, experiment's done. We can never have these guys crash. If they crash into each other, we destroy our load cell, and we, we, i.e., me, and everyone else involved are in big, big, big trouble because this is a very expensive apparatus, and more importantly, we can be um, uh, basically seriously hurt. You, you all know that I you know, like to have uh, an engaging lecture and a fun experience, but I, uh, just like with plagiarism uh, in this course and just like uh, with lab safety, I take, a very, very, uh, I take that extremely, extremely, extremely seriously. So this apparatus, you can be hurt. This apparatus, you can be seriously hurt um, or you know, catastrophically injured. Um, I told you, you know, if you were in person, one of the great things about this apparatus is it has this safety shield here. When I was an undergraduate uh, and I did this experiment, we had a shield that was something like the one you see here. Easy for it to kind of fall over, not super sturdy, um, and there are sometimes we do experiments without the shield. Why is that a horrible idea? Well, because when we fracture this material, it could shoot out at us. Um, I was doing an experiment, I, need to shoot, I keep moving around, sorry, but I was doing an experiment with a press like this when I was a senior for my senior design project making um, basically water filters. So I was pressing and pressing uh, and luckily, very not luckily because I had been trained very extensively, very seriously, I had my shield in front of me like this. I pushed, I pushed on the hydraulic press, the press burst, a basically a little kind of socket shot out. Um, luckily, the shield deflected it, went straight through the shield. It embedded itself into the wall that you can kind of see back there, about that distance. So it's pretty far away. Um, if I didn't have that shield, I don't know if I'd be here today. That, it would have gone straight through me. Um, so we need to make, take uh, lab safety extremely seriously. Uh, it is very, very important. You can never be in this lab without instructor, per, uh, instructor supervision and without an additional partner. So that can never, ever occur. So. With that aside, now that you're kind of aware, again, this device, don't be afraid of this device, but respect this device. Um, it's very important. Now, let's go ahead and see how we actually run this. So this is our Instron. You can see I'm not wearing the mask, but I'm, uh, I'm very isolated here, <laughs> making sure. I'm gonna open up the Blue Hill uh, Universal software. And my glasses are large enough for lab safety. I don't like to see myself <laughs> and my fancy camera flow. There we go. I'm not shy in person, but uh, let me go ahead. If you want to use this device, we're gonna to have to utilize. I love our touch screen, but there are some times when I don't really like it too much. So 
the, let me go ahead and give the password and the username. We'll see you back in a second. And we're back. So I want to create a test. So you can see here, there's lots of options for tests that you can create. Uh, and lots of kind of cool things that you can do, and a lot of automated reports that can come out of this too. But I want to train you not as a kind of technician, but as an engineer. So we're going to kind of do the most simple test, or I mean, not simple, so you can see here. We can look at compression, uh, peel, tear, flex, bending test, compression, relaxation. You can even do creep relaxation uh, method. But we're just gonna do a tensile test, and we are not gonna get fancy at all with the outputs. So you can get very, very fancy in terms of the test. So it could spit out all the parameters that I'm gonna ask you to calculate. But why would I let, you, let the machine do that when we could do that ourselves in Mathematica? Uh, <laughs> uh, sorry, but we need to learn this ourselves. So the only thing that we're gonna do is we are gonna kind of do our control for the test. So I want my strain rate, as stated in my lab handout, to be 15 millimeters per minute. If you change the strain rate of the material, or the strain rate of your test, Mechanical properties can change, especially for polymer materials. Take my MEC202 course to see more. And we're going to stop the test, end of test, once our force drops by 40%, basically when material fractures. So let's go ahead and do our first test. So I am going to place my first sample, aluminum 6061, into these drops. So I'm going to place them in here. And then I'm going to actually first, I'm going to kind of lower these guys a little bit. Lowering the jaws. I'm lowering it with this right here. And then I'm going to put the sample in. And I just want to grip it kind of at the base here. So I'm going to kind of hold this and I'm going to twist. You're not going to be able to see this, unfortunately. But I'm just going to grip this here. Now you can see me. Super strong. I used to be an athlete. I played football at MIT. <laughs> I don't know if that constitutes athlete or not. But anyways. I want this grip to be extremely, extremely tight on this material because I don't want any slipping to uh, influence my results. Because we are going to get an output. I'm just moving this up. Let's see. Up, down, up. You see how I'm not putting my hands in here? Never put your hands in here when you're moving. So it's right here. I'm going to grip this. And you can see when I'm gripping this and I'm pushing here, look at the force. The force is changing. So if I push down on this head, the force changes. If I push on this, now that it's connected, it'll change. But basically the force, again, is measured from these strain gauges on this load set. So I've got my apparatus, or I've got my material, aluminum 6061 in here, pretty nice and even, strong, secured, no slipping. I'm gonna close right here. You can see my displacement. I'm gonna just zero this, so I'm gonna zero my displacement. Uh, I'm also going to go into my soft key section. So soft keys, because I want to be able to uh, balance. Uh, I'm going to put this, do balance right here. Balance force. Why do I want balance force? Well, in the event that my material doesn't fracture and it's stuck there, I need to make sure I don't want to basically unwind and unclip those draws when there's a force applied here. So I need to release the force, balance the force, uh, and release that tension of the material so it doesn't spring back and hit me. So I've got my clothes, so where it's nice and secure here. This is an emergency stop in case anything happens. I've got my, my knobs in place. Now, I can measure strain, and actually you're gonna be given data where we are gonna measure strain from this, uh, basically it's a extensometer. So you can put this excellent summer, clip it to the material, and then as it stretches, this is going to move. So it's just an excellent summer. It's a way to very accurately measure strain. So you're gonna be given that. Now why am I not showing that or doing that in this uh, right now? Because one, it's kind of dangerous to put on there, and then when the material breaks, you can break this excellent summer. This excellent summer is very expensive. Um, if we need to do accurate results or experiments, we will do that. But your data already has that. And I wanna kind of just show you the mechanical behavior cleanly. It's hard to see once you have that guy on there. So for more advanced things, we'll do that. Also for some polymers, there's gonna be a kind of a fun example that it would break because, we, well, I don't wanna give anything else away. So you're gonna get a plot of force versus displacement or again, strain, strain percent. Uh, and we're gonna to have to calculate and then convert that to stress versus strain. So 
let's go ahead and find out and see where this material yields, if there's a neck that starts, and let's go ahead and get started. So I'm gonna press start, and then it's gonna start. Force is increasing. All right, so let's get in place. Here's the part where I tell you to cover your ears if we were in class. So, nothing happening yet, but I see that the force is starting to plateau. I'm gonna kind of narrate what's happening there. I'll tell you when my force drops and we can kind of see if we see a neck. Now for this material, again, aluminum's fair, somewhat ductile, but again, it's a metal. So we might see a neck occur. I'll try to point it out to you when that happens or when you might expect it to happen. Nothing happening yet. I think I see a neck starting to form, possibly. Hard to see behind the camera. But there it was, Ooh. <laughs> Always shocks me. So really not much of a neck at all. Oh, I'm sorry. I always get a, uh, it's been a while since I ran this experiment. Holding the camera is not easy. <laughs> That'll be a fun jump, uh, scared to see. All right, so if we look at our stress strain curve, can you see this, right? Slight, slight neck and then drop. Now I'm gonna do the exact same setup. I'm gonna put copper in there and then we're gonna record that. Woo, all right, that gets the blood uh, flowing early in the morning. <laughs> all right, I'll see you in the next video. And we're back with copper this time. So in comparison to aluminum, we might expect copper to be a little bit more ductile. Again, not as ductile as polymers, but for metals, copper's pretty ductile. If you worked with any kind of electrical things or like me, if you were digging a hole in your backyard and you accidentally clipped the uh, electric line that controls the sprinkler head and then you had to kind of work with copper and put it, anyways, long story short, copper's fairly ductile. So let's see. So this red line was our aluminum, 6061. Let's see how that compares to copper. So there's some force initially on it. I'm gonna press start. Start, same, same conditions. And let's go. Try not to be scared this time, but I'm not going to guarantee anything. All right. I'm trying to look and see if there's any uh, neck that forms here. But it might form very, very quickly. I think we might be forming the neck. Next form, uh, I think it's forming a little bit. I think I could see it right at the center there. It's hard to see. Right there, I think you see right there at the center. So right here. There it is. <laughs> All right. Somewhat exciting, but you can look at this fracture surface again, the lows at least. Much more ductile here. You can kind of see like the little, the neck that started to form right on the, sorry, right on the edge there, right? As opposed to this guy, where, nice, look at that fracture, just instant to end. Fracture right across that boundary. Now, but you might be asking, why are we fracturing at that location in the middle? Well, there's not really a particular, you know, fracture is kind of stochastic. Um, so fracture can occur, it's basically, it's gonna, it's, fracture is your last resort. So your material is gonna fracture when it can't, stretch any more, stretch any bonds, or you know, creating these new surfaces is worth it to release that elastic strain energy. Uh, so there could be micro cracks there, so there could be some anisotropic <laughs> uh, parts of the material, inhomogeneous uh, basically aspects or regions, so uh, that could be where that crack occurs. But, so let's look at our, uh, so this kind of darker number two, look at here. So we know that copper is stiffer than aluminum, which we might expect, and much more duct or more ductile. So fantastic. So now to my favorite materials, polymers. You'll see some very confusing things happening soon. All right, I'll see you in the next video. And we are back once again, and this time with a sample of polystyrene, which is an amorphous polymer, fully amorphous polymer. Um, and we are going to, uh, again, look at the mechanical properties of the material. So. We should expect this material to be much, much less stiff, but much more ductile. Let's see if our intuition about polymers and metals is right. So, press start. And let's go ahead and let's see what happens with this material now. So we look at our polymer sample and 
could go ahead and look at the look at the curve. Look at this green guy. Much, 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 much less stiff. So if we look back at here, we're gonna see pretty soon, let's see if we see a neck form in our polymer sample. So an amorphous polymer has chains. Oh, you can see it, so you can see it start happening. Right at the middle there. So an amorphous polymer has chains that are kind of like spaghetti. Um, they're just completely kind of entangled and it's just that it's kind of spaghetti mess. There's no real kind of chain alignment or order. Polystyrene, as we saw in our, actually, or similar to PMMA in our XRD lab, is, has an amorphous structure. Um, so there's not any order regions. But look at that, look at that next starting to form. Right at the center there, right? You can see clearly the thinning. That's why I love polymers. Metals, it happens too quick often to see, but look at that neck. Oh, very impressive. Let's look at it from the other side. Look at the next start form, but look at that crack, and it's it, that's it. <laughs> so, that is our amorphous polymer. Now, amorphous polymers are very, very brittle, but look it, you can still see much more ductile than our metals. So, last one, high density polyethylene. Let's see if there's anything unique here. And we are back with our last sample, which is our high density polyethylene. So, let's go ahead and see what's gonna happen with this sample. So, same idea, look at our curves, compare, and let's go ahead and press start. So, the beginning will be very similar. Pulling, not much interesting happening just quite yet, but, ooh, let's look at, I didn't zero my displacement, so ignore that, but you can see the force is much lower, as we might expect. Polys, uh, polystyrene is a very, basically brittle and stiff material. Actually, oh, it's gonna be so unfortunate, I should have zeroed, but um, you're gonna see that later that the displacement, or the, our strain, this is gonna be much more ductile. So, let's go ahead and see what's happening on our curves here, or to our material. So, pretty similar so far. You can kind of switch and look back on the curve. And we can see our force values are kind of just like plateauing. Uh-oh, they're starting to decrease a little bit. What's happening in our material? Nothing quite noticeable yet. But we are starting to maybe see a neck form. Let's go ahead and go back. So we're still pulling. Oh, maybe there's the neck starting to form there. Oh, I think I might see it. Let's go ahead and just double check with our curves. Look already. Look at how much more ductile it is. Very, very, very ductile. But I think we're starting to see at the bottom there that neck start to form. And we do, in fact, that is forming right at that bottom there. So probably like a quarter of the way up, you can kind of start to see it forming. Oh, here we go. Let's see, our material probably is going to fracture soon. Or will it? <laughs> the suspense is killing me. I'm sure it's killing you uh, wherever you're watching this video at as well. But look at this. Look at the neck starting to form. Just like last time, right? So we should expect to see a little tear and then bon voyage for this material. Oh, wait a second. Oops. My battery. Excuse me. Wait a second here. It looks like the neck has stabilized. Let's look at the force values. They're still decreasing a little bit, but they kind of, you see, it went up, dropped, and now it's kind of stabilizing. How is this, how is this material surviving? Well, this is a high density polyethylene material. This is semi-crystalline. So these chains have some regions called lamella where they're aligned. So as you pull this material, you initially kind of pull apart those amorphous regions, but now you're pulling and aligning the chains. The chains are stacking, and we know if chains align, we know that those uh, intermolecular interactions, those van der Waals interactions, the chains get closer and closer together, those interactions scale as a function of distance, so as the distance between the chains decrease, as they become more aligned, the strength of these interactions increase. And look at it, that neck stabilizing. The material is not fractured. Look at that, unbelievable. Look at how large this, uh, look at how ductile it is compared to every other material. Look at that. 
Amazing. Now, this guy is gonna keep pulling. I've got other work to do, but let's check in on it a little bit later. Beautiful, listen. Look at that guy. Stabilized neck. And you can see, look at the structure of polyethylene. It's C H H H H. Polystyrene is C H H H and then a phenyl group. With just a simple change in chemistry, a drastic change in structure, and a drastic change in mechanical properties. That is material science in a nutshell. And you're gonna write all about that in your lab. <laughs> and I look forward to reading those lab reports uh, and assessing them. All right, let's check back on this a little bit later. And we are back with high density polyethylene. And look at this. We got a fatal error, frame error from our, not fatal error, frame error from our machine. It didn't break. We still have forces right there. So I need to close this out and I need to go to my soft keys, which say balance force. And when I do that, the force is now zero. And I can go ahead and pop this guy out. So one of the easier ways to do this is actually to kind of scroll down. So let me undo this guy. Here, I'm gonna need to put the ca uh, camera down for just a second. So you can see it's a little stuck here. So let's get this guy off. This guy off here. But it matched, it went all the way up. <laughs> the frame actually stopped. Look at that ductility compared to the other materials. Even poly, especially polystyrene too. And you can really visualize it by looking at this. Ignore my other notes. Look at this. This is my favorite takeaway from this lab. All, look at that simple change in structure, a chemical structure, leads to a change in kind of your atomistic or your, you know, your atomistic or atomic structure. And look at that change in mechanical properties. Structure influences pop, uh, properties. If you don't take anything away uh, aside from the stress strain curves in this class, that's a key aspect of material science. We can change the structure of the material we can, with simple kind of chemical changes, uh, and we could dramatically change the properties. Look at that. Let me get one more shot of this guy. Oh, so beautiful. I love material science. So hopefully you guys do too. So that's the end of this lab, at least for conducting it. Now comes the even more fun part, which is analyzing the data. Uh, and you guys can watch, uh, everyone can watch that on, um, uh, on the YouTube video where we kind of analyze that in Mathematica and look at the notebook and yeah, but that's it. Thanks. And I will see you all uh, basically for the analysis part. So unfortunately the fun part is, well, the fun part continues next. All right, thanks.